Thanks for joining. My name is Parmendir, and I'm going to continue this conversation about breast cancer, um, but to dig a little deeper into incidence, mortality, and access to care in a high-income country like uh, Canada and uh, low- and middle-income countries. So here's an image of the top incidences of new cancers for females in 2020 of all ages, and you'll see that the majority of cancer patients are diagnosed with breast cancer, with the exception of a few pockets of cervical and uterine cancers and LMICs. Now contrast that picture with the highest mortality from cancers for females of all ages, and you'll see a slightly different picture where lung cancers dominate many high-income countries, yet breast cancer and cervical cancers uh, dominate many of the low- and middle-income countries. So let's explore why there may be some differences in mortality and incidences um, of breast cancer in different parts of the world by performing a head-to-head -head comparison of two countries. We'll compare Canada and a country in Africa, Angola, which has roughly the same population. It has a different area and a different population density. And here's a busy slide displaying the different extents of incidence of cancers in Canada and Angola. Here is the age specific rate. So this is a population adjusted rate of incidence uh, for two countries. Here you'll see that the incidence in Canada is about 2.7 times higher than that of Angola for all cancers and about 2.4 times higher for breast cancer specifically. And here are the statistics for mortality between the two countries and you'll see that roughly the, there's the same level of mortality from cancers when including all cancers in Angola and Canada. And with respect to breast cancer, there is a higher rate of mortality in Angola versus Canada. Now let's dig into this data a little deeper and see if we can explain the difference of two to 2.5 times higher rates of incidence of cancer, yet um, comparable or lower rates of mortality uh, from, can from breast cancer in Canada versus Angola. Comparing some basic statistics, you can see that there are some obvious differences in the GNP, mean years of schooling, 13 years, people are graduating from high school versus grade five, healthcare expenditures, there's some massive differences. And here's a statistic I think which is quite telling. The percent of females surviving to the age of 65 is 92% in Canada versus 64.7% in Angola. Another telling um, statistic is the the non-communicable disease causes of death in Canada is roughly 90% versus 31.7%. These are diseases that include cardiovascular uh, disease, cancer, diabetes, uh, diseases of those natures. And finally, uh, a very interesting statistic, which is quite difficult to find uh, um, in, in databases, are the number of hospital facilities with beds, <clears throat> roughly 1,000 in Canada versus 44 for a country with the same population. What about um, access to care and technology? In Canada, there are roughly 8.6 mammography units for every million, which calculates to 329 versus four in Angola, which I believe there might be a little bit more um, because I believe there's some, some mobile units now uh, being introduced in the community. But from what I gathered, I could only find about four to seven mammography units for this population. What about radiation therapy treatment facilities? So centers, standalone centers or, or centers affiliated with universities or other academic institutions, about 52 in Canada, two, 298 Lenox, 52 brachytherapy machines versus two centers, three Lenox and one brachytherapy machine. All of these are located within the capital city. What about the number of physicians, radiologists and radiolo uh, radiation oncologists? This pertains to the extent of medical um, training um, resources available in the countries. And you'll see that, for example, radi radiation oncology is 582 versus two in the country. Um, this was uh, obtained from the Dirac database. Radiologists, about 2,600 in Canada. That number is unknown. I was not able to find the number of radiologists in this country. Well, what contributes to differences in mortality and incidences in these two countries? Well, there are a number of things. 
some basic things. This country had gone through 20 years of the Civil War and are just recovering from that where much of their healthcare uh, infrastructure had been devastated or unable to be built. Coupled that with um, current challenges with refugee and asylum seekers from neighboring countries like the DRC due to conflicts in those communities. And you have challenges with basic food safety, child and elder care, ambulatory care, access to care, accessing primary care specialists. And then of course there's the community and support networks um, that are needed to, for instance, perform patient outreach. Remember these communities might not have access to a mammography unit and so they need to train the population on how to perform a self-breast examination becomes very important for the screening program. They're coupled with access to affordable medicines and the specialists that are needed uh, in order to deliver that healthcare in uh, healthcare uh, in hospital in the hospital environment. And then on top of that, there's the whole challenge of ensuring that there is uh, academic and clinical and intellectual infrastructure within that community to help cultivate that local expertise within those communities, let alone the safe implementation and use of radiation technologies. To help illustrate some of these challenges, consider this recent publication that looked at the knowledge and attitude of patients and practice of the arrest of breast cancer in outpatient consultations in a hospital in Angola. Some basic questions were um, provided to a number of outpatients and Here's some, some very interesting results. Many of these um, breast cancer patients really didn't know much about whether a lump was good or bad. They did not know the relationship between breastfeeding and whether they needed to uh, continue doing uh, self-examinations. Um, and here's an important quote that was extracted from this paper. The disparity in breast cancer incidence and mortality between developed and developing nations is because of the different levels of knowledge about risk factors for disease, access to effective treatment, and especially the existence of screening and early detection programs. And here are some more results from that paper. And it may be not so surprising to learn that the population does not have, doesn't know um, about performing self-examinations because they were never properly trained on how to perform a self-breast examination. In fact, the you outpatients know, of the mastology and maternity clinic at the hospital mostly do perform self-examinations, but healthcare professionals have not taught these patients how to perform self-examinations. <clears throat> and to just to hit that point home again, self-examination is an important detection technique as mammography is not available in this province, but only in the capital of the country. So what I'd like to emphasize here is that to achieve health equity on a global scale requires efforts on many fronts at the local scale. Now, these challenges and barriers are not unique to the developing world. Take, for example, the issue of breast screening and Syrian refugee women in Western Canadian provinces. There's also social inequities with regards to screening for immigrant Haitian women in Montreal. And extracted from this paper is a quote, which I think kind of hits the point, in that these populations and these communities have barriers. These barriers may be underestimated in underprivileged immigrant and non-immigrant communities. A preventative strategy must be adapted to different subgroups. It must, al take, must also take into account low literacy levels. To increase mammography uptake, it's crucial that the benefits of prevention be clearly identified and described in understandable terms. So we have an issue with regards to communication and community outreach here. Also, as demonstrated in the United States, we also see disparities in breast cancer, not just in the incidence, but also in the death rates uh, within different communities here reported uh, for whites versus blacks, Asian Pacific Islanders, Hispanic, and American Indian and Alaskan Native populations. And here is a fairly old paper that described the cancer survival disparities between First Nations and non-Aboriginal adults in Canada, finding that breast cancers provided the highest risk of mortality when compared with lung and colorectal cancer, anywhere between 1.5 to, to almost two times greater risk of mortality from breast cancer for First Nations people when compared with non-Aboriginals. I thought it would be interesting to compare how 
First Nations women in Canada, uh, particularly those in Ontario with regards to um, breast cancer staging compared with breast cancer staging in a country like Angola. So I'd gone through these papers and, and crunched through some numbers to look at the number of patients that are staged in stage one uh, versus those that are staged in stage two plus, so two and beyond. And you can see there are differences between First Nations and non-First Nation populations, significantly low uh, percentage of people staged uh, with early disease in Angola. And um, these differences are also present uh, with stage two plus. Note here, however, that the percentage of uh, First Nations individuals is 66% does encroach upon this very hard, very large number of, of about 80% observed in Angola. So where can medical physicists make a difference? I'm gonna show some examples of different technologies, radiation technologies and different educational and training opportunities and different patient uh, outreach opportunities that uh, medical physicists have been involved with. So to make a difference in incidence of mortality, you really do have to start at the beginning and that involves early detection and screening programs. And you're starting to see a wide number of mobile mammography units being deployed throughout Africa, uh, which provides access to care to rural communities using um, novel, easily transportable radiation technologies. And here is a non-oncologic application of these mobile technologies where an X-ray imaging system is within a uh, truck like this and can perform chest X-rays for tuberculosis detection. And there's a deep learning system that's embedded within that uh, system that can detect whether there is a potential risk for tuberculosis. And if that's the case, then the patient uh, immediately goes behind the truck to provide a to provide a sample um, for further testing. This technology had been deployed in Pakistan um, and a number of other countries quite successfully, and it's starting to become more common in other parts of the, the uh, low, and in, low and middle income countries. So again, providing access to care, um, providing opportunities to teach uh, the population, and also providing some opportunities for clinical training for those that are taking these machines out to these remote communities. We are seeing some novel designs of radiation therapy facilities, such as the Ruby, the upright photon therapy device, where instead of rotating the letter accelerator, you, the patient slowly rotates around a fixed source, thereby limiting the need for expensive shielding, um, which can be prohibitive when it comes to constructing uh, radiation uh, treatment facilities. And here is a different spin on that same idea where the radiation source is atop and uh, points down constantly, um, thereby limiting the need for expensive shielding. And the patient is rotated in a different way, um, lying horizontally, and the patient's rotated with a fixed source. This is uh, the nano system designed by um, the folks in Australia. Here is another um, device. It, this is a prototype. 200 kvp x-ray source for radiotherapy and imaging has a nice Canadian connection here patient lies on a couch you have a rotating uh, gantry system similar to a tomotherapy but you use 200 kvp x-rays um, which require less energy and will obviously require less uh, radiation shielding and so it's pretty um, cool that medical physicists are involved in developing these new uh, potentially exciting tools that could be deployed in LMICs. Another really important point is just the connecting with the community through leadership and mentoring. And here's a, a great website that explores that. Medical physicists can be involved through their professional organizations, such as the New Global Task Force through the APM. Um, there are partner organizations within um, other LMICs, such as FAMPO, which is an umbrella organization. Um, there are not-for-profit organizations which have a number of initiatives. Medical Physics for World Benefit has a, a new mentorship program they're initiating and the Open Syllabus Project. Visit the website to learn more. And then there's the whole issue of connecting with the undergraduate community, cultivating that expertise at the local level. And I, I think this is the, the space we really should start directing more energy uh, into. Um, let's start figuring out ways of connecting with undergraduate students, get them excited about medical physics, bring them into the fold so that we can cultivate that expertise at the local level. This is all going to require access, digital access and financial access and so forth. 
So this is my final slide. I want to emphasize the notion that in order to deliver global care or to achieve global equity and access to care, we have to think at the local level and have an appreciation and understanding of what the local challenges are. And my final message that I'd like to impart is as follows, that a failure to respect and consider local, regional, cultural, socioeconomic barriers to basic patient care and needs puts any medical physics initiatives, however well-intentioned, at risk. And this is true irrespective of location, whether it is in our own country, whether it's in our own city, or whether it's overseas. We really do need to make sure we capture and understand and respect those local challenges. Thanks for your time.